So in introducing what the idea of a binomial random variable is, um, it also, by the way, probably contains one of the trickier formulas uh, that you're going to have to see and work with this semester. So I'm hoping that by the end of our class today, we'll get a chance to take apart that formula, figure out how it ticks, and, and demystify the scary bits. Um, but to motivate what binomial random variables are and how we might think about them, I want to think specifically about one player playing in the World Series right now, um, one of the better hitting players on the Kansas City Royals, Ben Zobris, the second baseman. Um, and I want to open up today with the question, in their next game, game two of the World Series, I don't think it's tonight, is it? Is it tomorrow night? I forget which night it is. It's tomorrow night. Um, so, question. It was an incredible game yesterday. Um, I really wish I had gotten a chance to see it live, but I, I passed out because I have twin babies at home. Um, so, how many hits do we think Ben Zobris is going to get tonight? Seven hits? That would be something. Um, for reference, uh, yesterday in game one, he went three for six, which is pretty incredible. Um, it's, it's, not, it's a pretty solid game. Right. Went three for six in game one. Um, but the question I'm really more interested in answering is, what kind of information are we going to need to come up with a plausible answer to this question? How many hits do we expect he's going to get in his next game? Uh, so take about 30 seconds, talk that over with your team, and we'll get some ideas. What kind of information would you want uh, in order to come up with an educated guess for how many hits he'll get in his next game? Um, what did you say about the kind of information you would want in order to come up with a plausible answer? If ESPN called you up and asked you to make a prediction, as they do to so many sports pundits, um, what would you need to know? What information would you like? Let's start with this team here. Uh, you said depending on the pitcher. Okay, so who's pitching? That's one of the places that people often go. All right. What else? This group. His batting average. Okay. What else? Uh, the stadium they're playing. Okay. Where are they playing? After all, a stadium with real short fences or uh, or wide open outfields or something like that, you might have a different batting average. Okay. Weather conditions. Weather conditions. Sure. Probably a little bit harder uh, when it's colder, when it's rainy, and so forth and so forth. Of all of these different factors, um, which do you think is going to be the most important in predicting how many hits that Zobris gets tonight? Probably the batting average. I would agree with that. Um, and so that's kind of what I want to focus on. Um, because these other things are, in some sense, a little bit incidental, right? Um, the batting average that he has is an average over a long period of time of how many hits he's gotten over how many at-bats that he's had. Um, and these other factors are probably secondary um, to his performance on any given day. So in baseball, the batting average that a player has is just a quotient. It's a division problem um, of the number of hits that they have gotten. That includes singles, doubles, triples, home runs. Um, divided by the number of times that the player was at bat, um, which counts every time they come to the plate except the walks, the hit by pitches, and the sacrifices. Um, so it's this kind of technical definition that's supposed to measure how frequently when this person steps to the plate do they actually positively contribute themselves to the, the accruing of, uh, of uh, total bases and runs and so forth. Um, and what's, what makes this something that we're going to talk about, especially today, is that getting a hit, whether or not Zobris gets a hit when he goes up to the plate, is what we call a binary outcome. Every time he steps up to the plate, there's only two possible things that could happen. Either he gets one hit in that at-bat, or he gets no hits in that at-bat. Right? It's a yes or no thing. It's a light switch. It's either on or it's off. It's up or it's down. It happens or it doesn't happen. He succeeds or he fails. So there are only two possible outcomes. And whenever there are only two possible outcomes in a sample space for something, that gives us a kind of random variable we're going to start by focusing on today. Um, it's going to be called a Bernoulli random variable. Now, the batting average that Zobrist has is we're going to interpret that, again, with no other information about weather conditions or who's pitching or injuries or any of that stuff. We're going to use his batting average as a proxy for the probability that he gets a hit when he steps up to the plate. In this postseason right now, his batting average is about 333. Um, I rounded it down a little bit. It's a little bit higher than that. Uh, but just to make the numbers work out a little nicer today, uh, we'll say 333, um, which is a pretty decent batting average. This is, again, just taken from the postseason um, this year. Um, and so we would say every time he steps up to the plate, there is about this chance of him getting a hit. 
What is that as a fraction about? It's about one third, right? So when you see that decimal today, um, you can feel free to make the mental exchange. Think of it as one third probability that he gets a hit when he steps up to the plate. So that's the probability that he ends up with one hit in one of his at bats. So what does that mean is going to be the probability of him not getting a hit? How do we find that? 0.667. And how did you get 0.667? Um, 100 minus 0.333. Yeah, exactly. So the great thing about sample spaces that have only two outcomes is if we know the probability of one of them, then it, we automatically know the probability of the other. It's going to be what we call the complementary probability, one minus the other. Um, so if the probability of him getting a hit is 0.333, the probability that he doesn't get a hit is one minus 0.333, or 0.667. Um, so those two probabilities are really the only probabilities that we have in a random variable that only has two possible outcomes. We have a success probability that we'll call P, and then we have a failure probability that we'll call Q. Right? And the relationship between them is that Q is equal to 1 minus P, 100 minus the probability of, uh, of getting a success. So this is an example of the kind of random variable we're going to start out with today. We're going to call such random variables Bernoulli. It's named after the mathematician and statistician Johann Bernoulli. Um, and we're going to call a random variable Bernoulli if the only values that this variable can take are either 1 or 0. In Zobra's case, he gets one hit when he goes to bat, or he gets no hit when he goes to bat. Um, the probability that that variable is equal to 1 is often denoted by a lowercase p, which we call the success probability. What's the probability that it does happen when he goes to bat? Um, and the complementary probability, the failure probability, um, is often called Q. And again, relationship is that Q is equal to 1 minus P. But that also means Bernoulli random variables are not very interesting by themselves. Um, after all, it's, chances are that Zobris will get more than one at bat in the next game. And so this one single probability, this one third probability of getting a hit when he goes to bat once, um, is not really enough for us to answer the question, well, he's going to go to bat multiple times, probably, in the next game. So what's the overall outcome going to be? What's his total going to be across all of the different times that he goes to bat? So here's what I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to run a simulation of the next game. And how we're going to do that is we're going to take this probability, 0.333, that he gets a hit, um, and we're going to round that off to the one-third uh, that you told me about. So it's about a one-third chance that he gets a hit every time he goes to bat. So what you're going to do with your team, all right, so you've all rolled a bunch of dice now. Uh, we had a total of eight different teams rolling dice. Each one rolled 15 games. So how many games did we simulate here in total? If I'm doing my arithmetic right, we should have 120 games represented up here. Right. So we've just simulated 120 Ben Zobris games in which he had three at-bats per game. Right. And here were the, the totals that you came up with. So now the tallies are all up here. Um, let's actually get the, the frequencies that are represented. So how many no-hit games did he have? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 28 no-hit games. One-hit games, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 61 one-hit games. And 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 two-hit games. And only six three-hit games. Okay. So here are the frequencies of each of these possibilities. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to do now, I'm going to actually erase all these hash marks. Whoops. And I'm going to move these frequencies over. So my first question, I'm going to move this all up to here. Mm -hmm. OK. So first thing I'd like to know is, What's the most likely outcome? If ESPN calls you up and asks you to make a prediction, what are you going to predict? If Zobrist has three at-bats in the next game, what's the most likely thing to happen? We get two hits, one hit. Yeah, I yeah. think I agree. The most likely outcome for the next game is that he'll get one hit. After all, in 
61 out of the 120 games that you simulated. He went one for three. Right? Um, OK, cool. So let's take this information and see if we can answer another question. And the next question I want to know is, what is the expected number of hits based on this information that we could expect Zobrist would get? How do we answer that question? All right. So relative frequency, again, is a proxy for probability. So in 28 of the 120 games that you simulated, Zobris got no hits. So what percentage of the time did he get no hits? How would you, how would you compute that number? That's what the relative frequency is. Yeah, just take it and divide it by the total number of games that are represented here, 28 divided by 120. Relative frequency is the relative fraction, the relative percent of the time that we see a certain value. So if 28 times out of 120, we got zero hits out of three, then that's a 23.3% relative frequency. Um, 61 divided by 120? It's a little more than half. Yeah, 508. 508. So about 50.8%. Um, 25 out of 120? Eight. And then 6 out of 120, I think that's 0.05 or 4? 0 0.05. 0 0.05. 5%. 20.8%. Okay. So we have all of the relative frequencies and we have all the values of this random variable. So now how do we find an expected value? Same way we did at the beginning of the hour. Multiply across, and then add down. 1 times 0.508. Okay, so what, what are we multiplying? The like, hit by the... By the relative... That yeah, exactly, by the relative frequencies. So two hits multiplied by 0 0.208, 0 0.416, and then three hits multiplied by 0 0.05, that's 0.15 equals, equals. And if I add those all together, I get the expected value based on these relative frequencies. Um, it's going to be 0 0.9, uh, 0 0.974, I think. Which is approximately how many? Like, we can't have 0 0.974 hits, so what is this probably telling us? Yeah. It was the same thing that we observed before, that the most likely thing to happen, we think, is that he'll get one hit. And why is one, what makes one hit especially uh, a good prediction? Based on his batting average, why is one hit what we would expect to happen in three at-bats? His batting average was one-third, exactly. So we expect every time he goes to the plate, he has a one in three chance of getting a hit, and therefore, if he goes to bat three times, his expected number of hits should be one-third of So just by multiplying his success probability, one-third, the chances that he gets a hit every time he goes to bat, by the number of times he's going to go to bat three times, we get his expected number of hits over three at-bats to be one. So what changes? I'm not going to have you do all the simulation, but what would change if he had six at-bats instead of three at-bats? How many hits would we expect him to get? Yeah, why two? Yeah, exactly. The difference between this first uh, box up here on the board and the second box is that he's just getting twice as many at-bats. And all else being equal, if he gets twice as many at-bats, we can expect him to get twice as many hits. Right? Um, another way to say that is if he's getting six at-bats and the chances of him getting a hit in each one are one in three, then the total number of hits we can expect him to get is one-third times six, which is two hits. Right. So expected values for these totals are not that difficult to come by. If the chances are p that you're going to succeed every time that you try, and you're going to try a total of n times, 
then the total number of successes that we would expect to get is n times p. Right? In other words, p is not only the probability that you'll succeed uh, on a given try, but it's also the total percentage of times that we expect you to succeed if you were to do something multiple times. How many hits we expect him to get in a certain number of at-bats is kind of an easy question to answer. We just multiply his batting average by the number of times he's going to go to bat. Right? So that's not the hard question. The hard question that we want to answer is something more along the lines of what are the theoretical probabilities of each of the different outcomes that could happen in the sample space from before. So again, let me put up the table of values and probabilities um, that we could have for the number of hits that he can get in a game. So he can get no hits, he can get one hit, he can get two hits, he can get three hits. Um, and let's think about what the theoretical probabilities of these things should be. So here's how I want to think about this next. And this is hopefully going to lead us into uh, a formula that we can use. So suppose that he got no hits in a game. I'm going to use the letter H to represent a hit and the letter O to represent an out. So what must the outcome be? How would he write the outcome if he got no hits in a game and had three at-bats? We might write it like this. If he got no hits, that means that every one of his at-bats was an out. So out, 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 if you like. Likewise, if he went three for three, then what was the outcome? If he went three for three, there's only kind of one way to do that. He had to have gotten hit, hit, hit. Right? So that was the outcome if he got a total of three hits in the game. But let's suppose he went one for three. We decided this was the most likely outcome. Uh, what are the different ways that he could go one for three? So he, oh. yeah. So there are three different ways that he could go one for three. He could get a hit in his first at bat and then get out twice. He could get a hit in his second at bat and the rest are outs. Or he could get out, out, hit. In other words, goes over two and then gets a hit in his third at bat. So there are actually three different possibilities in the sample space that correspond to him getting one hit. What about two hits? Yeah, so there the story is the same, right? He could get uh, his first two, his first and his third, or his second and third. So there are three different outcomes uh, that are going on here. How many outcomes are there in the sample space in total? You could count all these up. One, two, three. I'm counting eight here. So there are eight possible outcomes. Oh, yeah. One outcome where he goes 0 for 3, three outcomes where he goes 1 for 3, three where he goes 2 for 3, and one outcome where he goes 3 for 3. Now let's try to figure out how probable each one of those is. So let's suppose that he goes 0 for 3. That means that he must have gotten out once, and then out again, and then out a third time. What's the probability of that happening? It's the probability of him failing three times in a row. And the probability of him failing once was this number q, 0.667. Um, the same similar thing happens for a probability of going three for three. In order to go three for three, he has to have succeeded three times in a row. And the probability of that happening is p times p times p. But, and this is the preview for where we're going next with this, if he goes one for three, that means that he has to succeed once, but fail twice. So the probabilities we multiply for 1 for 3 are going to include one success probability and two factors of a failure probability, first of all. But second of all, we observe that there are three different ways for him to do that. And so we also end up multiplying this by 3 because that's how many possible ways there are to arrange that one hit in his three at-bats. And a similar thing is true for going two for three. In order to go two for three, he has to succeed twice and fail once. So success probability appears twice, failure probability appears once, and again, there are three different possible ways for him to do that. 
So what we want to know and where we want to go next is figure out what <coughs> formula is being suggested here. How would we find the probability of getting a certain total number of successes in a certain total number of trials? Um, the total number of trials is often called capital N. In this example, it's three. It's the number of at-bats um, that he gets. Uh, success probabilities are P and Q. And then there's this funny number in the front. And that number in the front, I'm just going to tell you what it's called, and we'll worry about how to compute it later. It's called a binomial coefficient. And in, some, in this example, it's one or it's three, depending on which of these situations that we're in. So where we want to go next is to figure out how to compute these without having to list out all the possible outcomes. Because it's not that hard to do if he only has three at-bats, but imagine if he had six at-bats. Yeah, you would like to not have to do this every time. So what we want to do is come up with a formula that's going to avoid you having to do that. Um, and that'll be what's up next.